Hello and welcome to this presentation on the nuts and bolts of systems. This is an expanded and updated version of the presentation that I gave at the System of Systems Engineering in Konsberg, Norway in June 2016, so it's going to take quite a bit longer than the actual presentation that I made. I'm going to talk about eight topics, the effect of desired and undesired emergent properties, how the system development process relates to the iterative problem solving process, the relationship between the what's and the how's of systems engineering, how subsystem boundaries can change during system design, how the solution to one problem often creates a subsequent problem, the effect of unanticipated problems on the schedule, examples of use of the problem formulation template that I teach in my other classes, and some of the lessons learned from the widget system place, and I'm also going to talk about iteration and how we show it and how we should not show it. So I'm going to look at the situation from some of the holistic thinking perspectives. If you don't recognize what these are, please stop this presentation now and go back and pick up the other presentation that discusses them. or you'll be able to follow the rest of this presentation with, without an in-depth knowledge of the perspectives. So this presentation might encourage you to go back and look at the other one as well. The big picture, well, the widget project, it's the first project of its kind so that there are no similar systems in existence. Okay, a project like this is building a spacecraft for the first time, building a bridge for the first time, and so on. The system comprises two major subsystems, part A and part B, and I'm going to abstract out all aspect of the system development except for the approach to mechanically fastening the two subsystems together. So from a structural perspective, let's take a look at some definitions. First, a definition of a system. A set of different elements so connected or related as to perform a unique function not performed by the elements alone. Now there, this means that there are at least two elements or subsystems. There's a relationship between the elements and their interactions between the elements, which is often the same as the relationships, but not always. And there are many other definitions, but this is pretty much a minimal one that is included in most other definitions. And then I want to define emergent properties, looking at, this, at the system from the continuum perspective. They can be desired, undesired, known, and unknown. So this is the first slide that wasn't in the original presentation, or at least it was hidden because of the lack of time. There are four types of emergent properties, desired, undesired, and, and each one and known and unknown. So you've got desired, known, desired, unknown, undesired, known, and undesired, unknown, or you can look at it the other way and say known, desired, no undesired, and so on. You've got two tables here that show you a desired, known, emergent property is the purpose of the system. That's why we build the system. So all those parts, when they're working together in harmony, are doing what the system is supposed to do. And there are also known undesired emergent properties. These are flaws that occur every time, such as a design flaw. Uh, electrical engineers working with high-frequency circuits know that the circuits are often prone to oscillation, which is undesirable. So they put in components to dampen out that oscillation. Mechanical engineers will do similar things when they identify that there's a a tendency to wobble or something, they will put in a stabilizer. And a flaw is something that occurs every time. A risk is something that has the probability of occurrence. And then there are desired unknown. How can something be desired unknown? Well, all of a sudden it becomes known. But it wasn't the purpose of the system. And we call that serendipitous. I didn't know the system could do that. Wow, I want it to do that. That's great. 
And serendipity also provides opportunities. And then we have an undesired, unknown emergent properties, and we usually call those defects. Now, another definition from the operational perspective is the systems engineering process. Traditionally, this has been taught as the egg diagram. And this is the way I used to teach it 16 years ago at the University of South Australia. Now, I can define and explain every word, every phrase on this chart, and the explanation would be total, totally useless to anybody who wants to learn how to practice systems engineering. That's just one of the problems with teaching systems engineering in the traditional way. And also, this is not a process view. It's an egg. So what is the systems engineering process? Well, a process is represented by a flow chart. And you look in the literature and you will see a number of different versions of the process. You've got the egg in MIL standard 499. You've got another drawing in IEEE 1220. There's a list of processes in 1528. And then you've got the waterfall, the spiral, the V, and so on. And then there are other ones. So which one is the process? And then if we use the egg diagram as the process, how does it map into the waterfall view? And I struggled with these questions for a while, and then I reread IEEE 1220, and I saw a, a wonderful statement in there. The systems engineering process is an instant of the problem-solving process. Ah, uh huh. OK, now it all, everything fell into place. And I'm really sorry that uh, the people who wrote I Tripoli twelve twenty used the term systems engineering process because that connection to the problem solving process has gotten lost. And we should call it the system development process rather than the systems engineering process. So now let's move on and look at the widget project schedule. And we go down the states of the, of the system life cycle. The needs identification state, system requirements, system design, system realization, system integration, system test, and operation and maintenance. And you can see that um, just for the sake of example, I've shown it's the system development process starts with a milestone. That's the black triangle over here, and then each of the states is shown here in green blocks in this graph, or what we call a Gantt chart. So this is a project management perspective. It's also a temporal perspective because we're looking at a time view, and you can see that each of the states follows the others one after the other, and so we call it the waterfall view and it's from the Gantt chart. It's a planning view, and it's a success-orientated assumption because we assume that we're going to come out of each state in the normal exit and proceed linearly through the seven months of the process. And so you can see that what we do is we go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And that's why we call it the waterfall, because if you take away the background, this is the waterfall view. So the waterfall view is the same view as you get on a Gantt chart, in the ideal state where nothing goes wrong and we proceed through each of the states of the system development process in a linear manner. But now let's take a look at the systems engineering from the problem-solving paradigm. And what I want to show here is a generic problem-solving process based on Derek Hitchin's work. You can look, up, look him up on the internet, and Derek has got some very good videos on systems engineering. 
and you can see that the gray block starts number two, define the problem space, and ends with number seven. That's the Derek Kitchen's systems engineering problem solving paradigm, because according to Derek, systems engineering ends once you've figured out what the problem is, what the solution is, and how to realize the solution. I think that there's a little more systems engineering done in the implement solution system state and the verify solution system remedies the problem state. And then I've shown four milestones in that as well. So if we look at this, by the end of block two we have a clearly defined problem. We then conceive the solution options and we have a preliminary concept of operations for each of the solution options just enough to give us a feel for what that solution is going to do. We then identify ideal solution selection criteria, do the trade-off, select the preferred option, and at that point in time we might have what's known as an operations concept review because at this point of time we have a really good concept of operations. And once we have that, we then go into the formulate strategies and plan to implement state. And we write the requirements at this point, and we write the project management plan at this point as well. And, and then we end up at the system requirements review. I should have said we write the final version of the project management plan at this point in time. Then we have a system requirements review. We go ahead and implement the solution system. We will have the critical and preliminary design reviews inside block 9. And by the time we get to block 10, we're ready to test. So we have our test readiness review. We go into the verify solution system remedies the problem. And at that point, we have a delivery readiness review because we're now ready to hand the system over to the customer. Sometimes the system does work without any problems and the customer is delighted. Sometimes there are still some problems for various reasons I'm not going to go into now. And the customer will agree to accept the system with those defects, provided they're fixed later. And this maps very nicely into the waterfall. And you can see how the problem solving process and the systems development process map into the waterfall. Because what you're doing in each state of the waterfall is the generic problem solving process, except the activities, once you get into the detail activities, they're different. And the products that are produced and used in each state are different. And so the generic wording applies. The egg diagram does not have generic wording that are, applies in the later states. The egg diagram is written in the language of the earlier states of the system development process because the people who wrote it were working in that area, presumably. And the problem perspective is recursive and fractal which means you can open up any one of those blocks and what you see inside it is exactly the same set of activities. Now, each of those blocks puts out an output and that's a solution that specifies how something will be done. So for example, once you've finished the system requirements state, you have a solution that specifies how the needs will be met, that is, a design, or oh, sorry, that is a set of requirements. This becomes the problem to the system design state because the designers have got to figure out what has to be designed to meet those requirements. And after the system design state, you have a solution which describes how the requirements are going to be implemented, that is, you've got a design. And this becomes a problem for the next state because now they've got to figure out how to build or construct that design and so on. So you may have heard of people 
talking about the what's and the how's of systems engineering, what they're really talking about are problems and solutions. So a what is a problem faced at the start of the state, a solution at the end of the state explains how that problem is going to be dealt with, and this becomes the problem for the next state. In an ideal situation, there are no problems during the system development process, which is why we use it for teaching. It's simplistic. But we also need to teach what happens if the exit isn't ideal. So what's going on in those states? Well, there's work in three streams, management, development, and test and quality. And we use this work in planning and controlling project activities, or we use this chart. And I teach it as one of my thinking tools for applying the systems approach to project management. It can, the, the three streams of work consists of activities in series and parallel. Each activity produces a product using resources taking time. And each production activity exists in all three streams, management, development, product, test, and so on. Let me explain that. If you, if you guys are building something, you're in the development stream. But correspondingly for what you're building, somebody in the test stream is figuring out how to test it and then actually doing the testing. It might be the same bunch of people, it might be a different bunch of people, but we can separate out the development work and the testing work. And similarly, there's some activities in the management stream, first of all, before you do that work, to make sure you've got what you need to do that work so that the resources are there. And then while you're doing the work, to make sure you're conforming to the schedule and the budget. And by recognizing this three, you can apply that everywhere in the entire system development process. And that's what I'm going to teach in my, that's what I teach in my project management class. So you can see management, for example, was broken up into four activities, development into another four, and test into five. And what we do is we hide those lower level activities because it makes the drawing look complicated and complex. Now, I'd like to introduce you to this framework. And you can see the five layers, product, system, business, supply chain, socioeconomic, and the nine life cycle states, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And the five layers are Derek Hitchens layer. And we produce this framework back in 2000, when we were trying to figure out how what we had to teach in systems engineering. So we were trying to produce a system engineering body of knowledge based on the jobs, what systems engineers did in each of those areas of this framework. We gave that up. But we kept the framework. It's been very useful. All projects begin in column G, whether you're in layer five at the strategic level, and that is done in political science, not so much in systems engineering. Layer four might be integrated logistics support. Layer three would be system of systems engineering or operations research. Layer two is traditional systems engineering. And layer one is new product development. All projects start at the appropriate layer in column G. In the A paradigm of systems engineering, we then move to column A. That's why it's called the A paradigm. And so we've moved from column G to column A. And we've gone from a strategic concept through some steps down to actually starting to develop the system. And I'm not going to go through what those steps are in this short 
talk because it would be even longer than it is right now. So in the needs identification state, we developed the concept of operations for the widget system. We developed the conceptual architecture and we ended up showing the two systems fastened together. And the problem we're going to focus on is how to fasten the two subsystems together. And the conceptual solution we have is use a mechanical method. We could have used electrostatic method, we could have used magnetism, we could have used other methods, but our conceptual solution has focused in on a mechanical method. So let's take a look at the needs identification state in problem language, showing this drawing. We have our clearly defined problem, our preliminary conops. At the end of step six, we have a more detailed conops of the preferred solution. I mentioned this earlier. And at this point of time, we in seven, we're looking at the acquisition strategy and contractual issues that deal with acquiring the system. Should we build it? Should we buy it? Should we build it in house? Should we put it out as a contract? What kind of contract? And so on. The CONOPS would show how our system fits into adjacent systems, big picture view, as well as what it does, with a minimal focus on how it does it, because that's going to be developed later. On the other hand, the B paradigm starts in the requirements state. This is where we develop a matching set of specifications for the widget system and its subsystems. Are we going to, and so we have decided in our widget system that we're going to buy it, we're not going to build it. Because we did a feasibility study on alternative fastening methods, looked at a variety of suitable cuts fasteners and said they're cheap enough, well below the estimated costs of developing a proprietary fastener. So we're going to buy it. And we looked at magnetic and we looked at and we relooked magnetic and electrostatic and said, nope, it's got to be mechanical. And so even though the requirement limited the designer to the use of cuts mechanical, which is how it's going to be done, the requirement still specified the what because it didn't tell you which to pick. The requirement said the system shall use a cuts fastening function to fasten the two subsystems. The how or the choice of which type of fastener to use will be developed later during the system design state. So we can split the system requirement state into two. Let's take a look at what happens in the development and test streams of work. Generic problem solving process, but the need is to produce a match set of specifications and the output are the specifications in the development and test streams of work. And we conceive solution options and here we can look at requirements worded differently and, and choose the correct wording for the requirements to minimize misinterpretation. If you want to know more about that, take my requirements class. In the management stream of work, the need is to produce the realization plans and we put together, the output is the SEMP system engineering management plan, test and evaluation master plan, because the, the test people have been figuring out what they're going to test and how they're going to test it. And all that information ends up in the temp. And that's why I put it as a product in the management stream of work, because a plan after all is a management product. Now we move down to the system design state. So you can see that once we started from G, we're going down through these states pretty much in a linear manner. In a system design state, and here's the first example of the problem formulation template tool. 
the four parts. The undesirable situation in our widget system is the need to fasten two subsystems together using a COTS fastener. The feasible conceptual future desirable situation is the two subsystems fastened together. The problem to decide on a specific type of fastener and the solution will be the specific type of fastener which is going to be determined by the end of the state. So it might be a nut and a bolt, a rivet, a hook and a loop, velcro, or a nail, glue, or whatever. So we go into the preliminary system design state. And so this happens between SRR and PDR. And the system designer researched different types of fastening products and identified a number of them and then looked at how they would be used and presented a summary FCFDS and CONOPS of each fastening product at the PDR together with their advantages and disadvantages and the recommended solution. So if we look at this state in our problem solving diagram, the problem is the lack of or the need for the conceptual design we have some conceptual design, we conceive the conceptual designs and look, we look at their advantages and disadvantages and those and then we make the selection based on the solution selection criteria and how we weight them and we end up with a selected conceptual design. In the system, in the design state substate 2 which happens between PDR and CDR we have the need to convert the conceptual design to the physical design we look at alternative physical designs and we select a physical design and then we go ahead and sort of draw the designs and, and figure out how we what we're going to do a little bit further so the management people are busy updating the management plans in block 7. So in the design substate 2 we do some trade-off studies and we show that uh, the alternatives and the selected solution accepted by consensus at the CDR was to use a nut and a bolt. So when we have our system drawing we show the system with the two parts A and B and I've shown a partial view here because the, system, the A's and B's will be complex enough to have their own subsystems and there's your example of sub A1 and sub A2. On the other hand we now have a third subsystem or potential subsystem which is a nut and a bolt subsystem that consists of a nut and a bolt. So looking at this from a number of perspectives, from the generic perspectives, a nut and a bolt are generally used as a subsystem to fasten components together. They're not really a system on their own. From the continuum perspective, we can predict that since the system is the first of its kind, unanticipated, unknown and accounted for factors at design time may emerge when the system has been constructed and these might have or will have a negative or a serendipitous effect on the system. So we can expect to see all four types of emergent properties. That's where expect the unexpected really comes from. From the structural perspective, we have three subsystems at the moment, A, B, and the nut and the bolt, as you can see in the drawing. From the quantitative perspective, here we would discuss the number of nuts and bolts needed, the diameter of the bolt and the gauge of the screw thread necessary to carry the anticipated load. And this information becomes part of the requirement for the nuts and bolts subsystem and is presented at the CDR for the widget system. That's in layer 2, HKMF, that's the name of the framework and at the SRR for the nuts and the bolt subsystem in it in layer 1. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And so the nuts and the bolt subsystem specification contains the next largest standard cut size. We're not going to create our own 
size of nut and bolt. We're going to go to the catalog and say we need something with this size thread and this number, this gauge of screw or whatever mechanical engineers use for selecting nuts and bolts and we're going to pick the next largest one that's available in the catalog. We're also going to need to specify the location of the hole that will contain the nut and sorry the, the hole the nut the bolt goes through the hole right and the necessary clearance on the surface of the A and the B systems for the nut and once the system design state of the SDP has been completed at the CDR each of the subsystems begin their own system development process and then we go through the realization states. We're going through design, construction, unit testing, integration testing, and so on. And each of the subsystems will then go through their own life system development process at the product level because the nut and the bolt are considered to be products as far as this system is concerned. And then we sort of all come back to, and so while the product layer activities are going on, the systems engineers are making sure that the system specifications are still met as the products are being developed. So there's very little work for systems engineers to do during the subsystem design, construction, and unit testing phases. And that's why Derek Hitchin says systems engineers ends once you have a set of requirements. Although, on the other hand, the first time I took a systems engineering course back at, um, at University of Maryland, the person who taught it was a systems engineer from the Navy, and his version of systems engineering began when he received a set of requirements. So we go through the realization state. Each system is being worked on in parallel. They come together and we do the integration and testing. So in the system constructions, the realization states are the construction, te subsystem test, and system integration state. The A and the B subsystems are sufficiently complex to have their own systems engineers. And so the widget system engineer liaises with the subsystem systems engineers responsible for the A and the B subsystems to ensure that, including everything, the, the holes, the specified matching holes are in the right places and the holes align as specified and deal with other issues, power weight and so on that have been abstracted out. And we're lucky there were no widget system level problems arising during these states. So we get to the system integration and test states and we run the system test and the test conditions simulate the scenarios in the CONOPS where the system experienced different degrees of vibration. Oops, we have a problem. An undesirable emergent property showed up. It's an undesirable situation. Under some test conditions, the system came apart. The nut and the bolt no longer had the capability to fasten the subsystems together. So we did a test, we investigated what was going on, and we found out that the system was fine as long as it wasn't subjected to vibration. Once the system experienced a vibration greater than n units, the nut and the big bolt began to separate. Oh dear, major problem, back to the drawing board. So from an operational perspective, I can say the desirable emergent property is a system that's held together by the nut and the bolt. And here, an unknown, und hitherto undesirable emergent property shows up that under some conditions the system comes apart. And we do some investigation and we find out that it's vibration at a certain amplitude and frequency. And so, this unknown, undesirable emergent property was only unknown in its first implementation. It becomes a known, systemic, undesirable emergent property. It's a flaw, and it must be compensated for 
every time. So we're back to the needs identification step. So we've moved back from F to A. If we show the waterfall in the traditional functional perspective, you can see we go down from this one, this one, this one. We're down at system test, and then whoops, we don't get to the O and the M state. We go right back to the needs identification state. We never get to exit. So this is the traditional functional view of iteration. and I'm showing the normal exits and then we get to one abnormal exit. And we're back where we started. We have a little more experience. We know more about the system this time around and so we go down through the cycle again. But it's seven months later. So I can show you the revised schedule. At milestone six it's, whoops, we've got the problem, so we then have to replan the work, and we figure it's going to take exactly the same time to go through each of those states. And so I've got the additional six months delay, and the second iteration of the system development process began in month seven, and, in this, and it's going to end, we hope, in month 13. And it's shown in red because it's warning not supposed to be there, unplanned. And so this is shown at the milestone review and everybody says, okay, back to the drawing board, we will accept the new schedule. And you can see if I show it in the waterfall format, whoops, back we go up and we're going to go down again. So I'm showing once around the waterfall this way as well. And you can see where the delay comes in. We've gone from 6 to 13. Then we do some further analysis. We do an analysis of, in, of, the, of the magnitude of expected vibration in each of the operational scenarios in the con, con ops. That's why we went back to the needs identification state because we're getting an understanding of the situation. And if it's not a difficult problem, we might sort of do a mini loop, a mini waterfall inside the, the system test state. We would sort of add that on to the system test state. But what we would be doing inside that additional activity in the system test state would be a mini waterfall that goes through the entire system development process in miniature, in a sense, inside the system test state. So you could compress the red, all the red bars here into extending the system test state. But I've shown it in this way to make it very clear as to what's happening. We do the analysis and we find that no anticipated mission was expected to produce a vibration greater than 1.5. Okay, that's great. So we write a new system requirement. The system shall not come apart when, experien conti when experiencing continuous vibration of greater than 1.5 for up to 30 minutes. It's a poorly worded but understandable requirement. I mean, the, what do the words come apart really mean? A well-written requirement would specify a measurable minimum value of torque, if any, still holding the nut and bolt together after 30 minutes of vibration. Where did that 30 minute time limit come from? It came from the scenarios in the CONOPS. The system would never experience uh, that amount of vibration for more than 30 minutes at a time. So we now have a new schedule. Everything's good. The red has changed to green because we've accepted the new schedule and it still looks bad because it shows repetition. And I've shown it here. Traditional approaches, hide, some of the traditional approaches hide 
that repetition in here. And so you see a little box here, 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 and a little box here, and a little box here, inside an extended system test state. But this is an educational package, so I'm showing it what we really do. And because it looks bad, we ought to show it like this. And again, we hide this lower half in here, in an extended system test state here. We then move down through the process again. We come to the second system design state. And, the, and so we formulate the problem as the undesirable situation is a system comes apart when experiencing vibration greater than 1.5. The desirable situation is the opposite. The system doesn't come apart. The problem is to create the FCFDS and the solution is a way to compensate for the effect of the vibration. So we examine a number of different ones. We, we talk about putting some glue on the nut and the bolt or whatever, and we decide we're going to use a star washer. There's some tension there. And so we do some testing and we validate the solution and we say, that's great, the star washer works. So we now have a modified system. We've got the three subsystems, A, B, nut and bolt, and we have a star washer. What are we going to do with the star washer? Well, we're going to put it between the nut and the bolt. But how are we going to document this? And so the second iteration through the realization states looks pretty much like this, exactly the same as the first one. And so the system was constructed and tested. The solution was validated. The star washer worked as designed. And so we then reverted the system development process to the end of the initial system test state in month 12. But that five month schedule delay caused a cost escalation due to the unplanned activities in the second iteration of the realization states. Okay, we get to the system integration and test states. And during the system integration and test states, we do a an evaluation test, sometimes called, caused a qualification test. We see if we can break the system. So the requirement is for 1.5 units for 30 minutes. Well, let's see how long the system can go until it starts to come apart. And we did the test a few times and we found out that it was 88 minutes. Okay, so we have a great margin here, performance margin. So then we took the vibration up a little higher to two, and we tried that, and we saw that we could stand up to 73 minutes before it would come apart. So even if the vibration goes up higher than 1.5, we still have a good performance margin. And we decided to go for broke, literally, and turned up vibration and we found that when it experienced vibration greater than 3.14159 it came apart immediately. So now we know what the performance is and the components inside the subsystem were replaced by configuration control equivalent non-functional mass blank. So we took some brass boxes or wood depending on the weight so we wouldn't actually damage real components because all we were testing was the nut and the bolt part to see whether it came apart. What was going on inside the subsystems? Well, they presumably had their own vibration tests during the subsystem construction process. Now I noticed that number. Do we really have to write 3.14159? Wouldn't 3 be enough? The answer is it depends. In this particular case it would be enough, but in other cases it might not be and we might have to use more 
decimal places. So we now have a new problem. The undesirable situation is the need to place the star washer in a subsystem, existing or new. FCFDS is the opposite. The star washer is placed in a subsystem with optimized interfaces. Problem is to create the FCFDS, and we don't know what the solution is when we start the process. So we go through the design state again. So back we go. We've got to design which subsystem we're going to put it in. And so we revise the schedule. The prototype had demonstrated that the star washer would meet the performance needs, but the design still needed to be modified to include a star washer. We needed to validate the non-functional manufacturing requirements. So back to the third system design state, more delays, and we're now supposed to end at 13, 17. So we run through the design, we're planning to run through those states again. We don't need to go back to the requirement state, but we do need to go back to the design. And again, sometimes the, those activities are hidden in an extended system test block because we're not actually doing more system testing. We're actually going down through this, through this development process cycle again. And that's why I've shown it here. So in the third system design state, we look at the alternatives. Uh, which subsystem do we put the star washer in? And the, altern the preferred solution was to include it in the nut and the bolt subsystem. And we named, renamed the subsystem as a fastening subsystem. That was accepted as a CDR. And the documentation was updated, and since this design decision only impacted the documentation, there was no need for any further realization states, and so the SDP fast forwarded to the system test state in month 14. So we moved forward. And if I show the revised schedule, good news finally, it was a documentation only. We can skip the realization and system integration states. We picked up two months. As you can see on the drawing where the green arrows move back and where the green blocks in 16 and 17 move backwards in time, forwards in time, move backwards in time to blocks 14 and 15. And we now plan to end at month 15. And if those earlier activities were rolled up, then it wouldn't look as bad as it looks right now. But again, I'm showing you where the iteration comes in. And so the pro pro total project delay is from 6 to 15. So from the structural perspective, here's a structural perspective of the widget subsystem. We've still got our A and the B. We've renamed the fastening subsystem. It's from the nut and the bolt, and the fastening subsystem has three subsystems or components, nut, bolt, and star washer. So remember this functional perspective drawing where we had once round the, the loop? This time we go, we come, the second time around, we come out of the system test state and go back into the design state and then go down the loop. But we don't actually go all the way down the loop, we actually skip down to system test, and then we come out. So showing iteration like this, and even just showing the paths that we took and not putting in all possible iteration paths is confusing. It does show the normal and abnormal exits, but it's not really very useful. And that's why iteration needs to be shown from the temporal perspective, that's the Gantt chart, and not the functional perspective. And that's why most systems engineers don't see it, because Gantt charts are management tools. But they can also be systems engineering tools, and they should be. So our completed project, we get to milestone 15. Good news, no further problems. The project ended. and. There are some handover activities included in the project after the O and the M state starts. 
and that's why the project doesn't actually end until the O and the M state has started. And again, iterations need to be shown from the temporal perspective, not the functional perspective. So you can see where we iterated back at a milestone at the end of six months. We iterated back at the end of 12 months, but we iterated forward at the end of 13 months and then completed in the normal way. If I show it like so, it hides the iteration, but it still leaves that little blank. And so I can show it like this. Looks better. It's hidden. And so there are various ways that you can use the Gantt chart to hide the, the poor scheduled performance. Because remember, every time there's a consensus that we accept the delay, we replan the project and we reset the baseline. It's only if you look at it as a whole and you look at the whole timeline. And quite often the early months are disappear and you're only shown the, the stretch of time that you're in. We ought to show this one like so because at the end of six months we're over. Some projects do show it, some projects don't show it. Which one, which is correct? Well, it isn't, there isn't right and wrong. It's acceptable. If you show it like this all the way through, once you get past miles, month six, you still need to show where you're in conformance with the revised plan and where you're not. So you do need to start using greens and reds there. So you use the technique that's least confusing. Now let's look at the system development process from the operational view. Remember I said it started in G and then we go through three streams of work between each of the milestones and each of these milestones at the beginning and end of the stream are the same milestone. It just doesn't show up in this drawing. And you can also use the three streams of work to look at the big picture and say the system development process goes like that. And you can show iteration in this way. So I have just gone through the iterative process of systems engineering. I'm using problem language and I've shown you integration and how the systems engineering is, is iterative and fractal and how each in each area it's the same process but we deal with different problems and different solutions and different products and different activities but it is still the generic problem solving process. And we can have a feed forward there. So the lessons learned from this project include system and subsystem boundaries may change during the system development process. Supposing we had put that lock washer inside A or B, the subsystem boundary would have changed. We didn't in this particular case. Unknown undesirable emergent properties become known through experience. The vibration. Any mechanical engineer who's experienced it once will never forget and will always use a lock washer. I can remember when I built my first piece of electronic equipment, I fastened it with a nut and the bolt. And then I used to wonder why the nut and the bolt loosened themselves up after time. I was a teenager at the time and building amateur radio equipment. And it was a while before I learned about vibration because I was learning to be an electronic engineer, not a mechanical engineer. And in classes on electronics, we didn't learn about vibration. We usually compensate undesirable emergent properties by additional functions in a component that may not seem to contribute to the mission of the system. So I'm looking at the nut and the bolt and I'm saying, what's this lock washer doing? Let's get rid of it. We don't need it. 
because I don't understand why it's there. If you're not sure why something is there, don't take it out unless you want to run all sorts of tests on it. And even then, you may not run the right test. So if you're not sure what purpose a component serves, ask. On the other hand, then that component may really not be necessary or similarly in a process. When you're looking at a process, there might be a step in the process that doesn't seem to be necessary. And if you want to know should you take it out or not, you've got to research the history, that's the temporal perspective, of that process to find out why it's there. And I can give you an example. I went, I visited Israel earlier this year, gave a talk at a conference, and when I come out, I go through passport control, and they give me a little piece of paper. A little piece of paper. And I take this piece of paper, I go around the corner, I put it in a machine, and that lets me through into the departure lounge. And I think to myself, why do I have to take this piece of paper, walk around the corner and put it in a machine to go through the departure lounge? It's totally nugatory. And then I remember, years ago when I visited Israel, you didn't put the piece of paper in a machine with a turnstile, you gave it to a person. And I wondered then, why is that person standing there collecting that piece of paper from somebody who's just walked around the corner? And I thought about it and applied some systems thinking and I thought, well, Israel was a socialist state. And so what the government, and this is, I don't know if this is the real solution, but it sounds plausible to me. What the government did at the time was they gave people jobs. And so they created this job that there was a person who, ha who had a job collecting the pieces of paper from people leaving the country. And instead of collecting unemployment benefit and sitting around doing nothing all day, the person had a job, had dignity, and felt they were doing something useful. And then, of course, there were spin-offs here because somebody else had to create the piece of paper and print it and so on. And so don't remove something that you don't understand why it's there. In this particular case, we could eliminate the piece of paper. But as the Israelis do, they use a bit of systems thinking here. And when you arrive in the country, they also give you a piece of paper. And that piece of paper serves as a substitute for a stamp in the travel document. Because unfortunately, due to political, the political situation in the world, if you have an Israeli stamp in your passport, there are other countries that won't let you in. So Israel stamps this piece of paper when you come in, a piece of paper when you come into the country, and this piece of paper when you go out of the country. At least one piece of paper serves two purposes. They could have had two pieces of paper. In summary, I talked about the effect of desired and undesired emergent properties, how the SDP relates to the iterative problem-solving process, the relationship between the what's and the how's, how the subsystem boundaries can change, how the solution to one problem often creates a subsequent problem, the effect of the unanticipated problems on the schedule, gave you some examples of the use of the problem formulation template, which is described in another video presentation, talked about some of the lessons learned from the widget system case, and discussed iteration and how it's best shown. Any questions or comments? in the usual way. And do you know I carried that bear around for seven days during the INCOSI 2009 conference and nobody asked me why. <laughs>